Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rohan Mirzaghi. I'm a PhD candidate in the lab of Dr. Winston Tim at Johns Hopkins University Department of Biomedical Engineering. And I want to thank the organizers of this event for inviting me to talk to you today about one of our projects, measurement of DNA methylation and laminate associated domains uh, using nanopore sequencing. So before uh, we dive into the nanopore sequencing part of it, I just wanted to quickly refresh our memories. Uh, what are lamina-associated domains, or LADs? These are uh, genomic regions that are in close proximity of the nuclear lamina. Uh, they are relatively uh, quite uh, large regions, um, somewhere between uh, 10 kilobases up to 10 megabases in a typical uh, mammalian cell. And as sort of expected from the observed tight association of condensed chromatin with the nuclear lamina, LADs do possess several molecule features uh, that I am uh, showing on the right-hand uh, right side table of this uh, presentation uh, that are typical of heterochromatin. Uh, for example, most genes in LADs are transcriptionally silent or uh, expressed at low levels. Uh, and also they overlap with the regions that usually replicate uh, very late during the S phase. Um, and another feature that uh, we are interested in uh, are the fact that uh, LADs are enriched for histone modifications that are typical of heterochromatin as well. Um, usually these regions are identified uh, using the technology called DAMID. Um, so what is DAMID? DAMID is a technique that, uh, in which we are using this bacterial DNA adenine methyl transferase, or called DAM, uh, that deposits N6A uh, in a sequencing context of GATC motifs. Um, and this technique is not unique only for looking at lamina associated domains. It could be used to look at any sort of DNA protein interaction studies. And the way that we do that is basically you're uh, fusing these uh, uh, DAM methyl transferases to a protein of interest here, uh, typically being uh, any lamin protein, typically being uh, lamin B1 here. Uh, and then we have a stable expression of this construct into your cell line. Uh, and then from there, uh, you would have the position of uh, M6A into your any DNA that is in close proximity of a nuclear lamina. Uh, these base modifications are usually uh, visualized by microscopy uh, or IF, uh, or they can be investigated using uh, high throughput uh, Illumina sequencing uh, with uh, enrichment of uh, methylated DNA fragments uh, by using um, a variety of methylation ever restriction uh, digestion and PCR. Now that I told you about uh, what DAMID is, uh, in our lab, we do a lot of uh, nanopore sequencing and we do a lot of long wave sequencing uh, technology. Um, so one of the main questions that we had was that, can we uh, adapt this uh, technology, this method uh, to uh, long wave and more specifically nanopore sequencing? So I'm going to give you a very brief overview of nanopore sequencing here. Uh, in nanopore sequencing, we have a biological nanopore protein that sits into a biolipid membrane, as I'm showing it on the lower left-hand side. Uh, and we're applying voltage current across this um, uh, biolipid membrane. And we're passing a single strand of DNA or RNA uh, at a, a controlled speed of translocation using a helicase. Uh, and this uh, speed of translocation is usually around 450 bases per second for DNA and about 75 bases per second for a native RNA molecule. And as these uh, strands of uh, DNA or RNA uh, passing through the pore, they are blocking uh, the current that in a unique way that is dependent of the sequencing context of that specific uh, K-mer, which is typically five or six mers. Um, and then from these unique uh, current disruptions, uh, as I'm showing in the table, in the, in the plot in the middle, 
uh, we can infer the sequence of the DNA or RNA molecule that was passed through the pore. Now, there are a lot of uh, advantages and disadvantages to this technique, but one of the advantages that we are particularly very interested in is that uh, we can look at uh, DNA or RNA-based modifications. And uh, we can do this because we are essentially looking at electrical raw data to infer these modifications. So we're not limited to any to canonical phases, but we can look at any sort of epigenetic or epitranscriptomic uh, changes uh, in the nucleic acid. Um, and here I'm showing two example uh, current distributions. Uh, on the, for the plot on the left, uh, we are looking at the uh, DNA motif of TGG-ACG uh, that is shown in the black and it's uh, K-mer that has the 5-MC methylation in red. And we're looking at the current distribution, and we can see that there's a clear significant shift to the right when we are having the, uh, the 5-MC methylation. And through the work of our lab and other uh, groups around the world, uh, it has been already shown that we can call 5-MC methylation very robustly using the nanopore sequencing platform. Um, but when we're looking at the similar comparison and what is relatively new on the right side, uh, focusing on the M6A methylation, we can see that the shift in the signal it is there, but it's not as nearly as strong as what we observe usually uh, with the 5MC. So what I'm trying to show here is that I, I understand that this is a small uh, example, but what I'm trying to show here is the fact that Calling M6A using nanopore sequencing is a much harder and challenging task than 5MC calling. Now, there are uh, a variety of tools that we can use to call methylation uh, using nanopore data. Uh, we're usually using uh, two tools in our lab. Uh, one is called Megalodon, uh, which has been developed by Marcus Stoiber at uh, ONT. Um, which uses a neural network based models to call uh, base modifications. And we also use nanopolish uh, that was developed by uh, Jared Simpson, our collaborator in uh, Ontario Cancer Research Institute, um, that uses a hidden markup model based algorithm to call uh, base modifications. Now that we're using these tools, uh, one of the main questions that we had was, uh, which one performs better? How did it compare? So what we did is we generated the ROC curve uh, that uh, my lab mate actually generated at Yun Fan Pan. Um, what we're showing here is on the x-axis false positive rates and the y-axis true positive rates. And just for the second, just focusing uh, on the CPG calls that are shown in red uh, and nanopolish calls on uh, show, showed in, with the solid line and megalon calls with the dashed line, we can see that CPG calls for both of these software are very well uh, called. And we can confirm that by looking at the table area under the curve uh, or AUC, we can see that the CPG calls for both nanopause and megalon are 0.92 and 0.94 respectively. But when we're looking at damage, we can see that the megalon calls uh, are outperforming nanopolish calls pretty significantly. And the AOC call, AUC calls are 0.68 for nanopolish and 0.86 for megalodon. Um, and this could be due to a variety of reasons. Uh, and I, we think that we need uh, better training sets and better algorithms to call these M6A methylations in, in a better way. Uh, but the main question here is that, is this good enough for us to be able to call LAD and look at uh, laminate associated domains using nanopore sequencing? And for that, uh, we performed a pilot experiment with a collaboration uh, of uh, Dr. Bas Van Stilton in the Netherlands. And the outline of this experiment is that we use uh, haploid cell lines, HAP1, cells uh, that have the stable expression of these damlamin B1 constructs. Then we selected these cells at the early stages of S phase. 
and we perform both uh, conventional uh, DAM ID as well as um, nanopore sequencing. And then we wanted to look, uh, look at comparative analysis of CPG calls and DAM methylation calls using the two softwares that I mentioned earlier. And just looking at one example here, uh, percent methylation calls across the chromosome 10, uh, nanopolish calls are shown at the top, um, melan calls are shown at the bottom, uh, the red curve shows CPG methylation percentage, and the blue curve shows uh, DAM methylation percentage here. And the pink rectangles here shows the labs that were identified using the conventional DAM ID sequencing using Illumina sequencing. Um, what we can see immediately here is that we do see a shift uh, in the methylation calls inside the labs. Uh, there's a hypermethylation of DAM methylation as expected, and there's a hypomethylation of CPG calls inside the lab. Just to show this in a uh, sort of a better way, I I'm focusing on one of the regions here, uh, so we can showcase this better. Megalon calls are shown on the left side, and now polish calls on the right side. We can again see this sort of sharp increase uh, in uh, DAM methylation inside the lab and uh, a hypomethylation of CPG calls inside the lab, which is uh, consistent with the uh, current literature that exists on this specific cell line. Um, what is also really interesting here that we can see a sharper increase in the uh, megalon calls relative to nanopolish call, which is sort of expected because of, oh, I already showed you that megalon uh, has a better uh, MCSA calling than nanopolish. Now, what I'm showing here is um, basically the, the same result that I showed in the previous slide, but in a more um, genome-wide manner. Uh, when we are looking at DAM methylation calls at the top, uh, we can see that for both megalodon and nanopolish calls, we see significantly higher methylation rates. Uh, inside the lab versus outside the lab. Now, the point that I want to emphasize here is that we don't really know the true methylation rate uh, of DAM ID assays because up until now we have been uh, relying on enrichment methods and PCR to uh, sort of detect these methylation rates. But with single molecule assay like nanopore sequencing, we could potentially look at uh, the true methylation rate, assuming that we can achieve uh, a robust methylation calling algorithm and software. But just looking at these results, we do expect that this uh, true methylation rate be somewhere between 4 or 5% uh, up to uh, 20%. And similarly, when we're looking at CPG methylation at the bottom, we can see that uh, the, both of megalodon and nanopolish calls are hypomethylated inside the lab. And we do see a little bit of discrepancy uh, when we are looking at the inside lab uh, for nanopolish between uh, nanopolish calls and megalodon calls. And megalodon uh, is calling uh, less of a methylation percentage uh, than nanopolish. And currently, we are investigating this further to see if there's any biases associated with any uh, KMERS uh, between the nanopolish and megalodon call. And lastly, uh, what uh, I wanted to focus on is to look at the edges of the lab. Uh, as we know that uh, these edges are uh, enriched with a lot of different uh, DNA protein interactions, such as CTCF binding site. Uh, so they are very important uh, for our purpose. Um, and at the bot at the top, I'm showing the DAM methylation calls. Again, uh, megalodon in blue, uh, nanopolish in uh, red, and, and the lab boundaries are shown in pink. And we can see as we're moving from uh, outside of the lab to inside, we see this sharp increase in methylation calls, uh, which 
is very interesting because uh, now we can see that uh, and identify these uh, edges uh, with a better resolution. As you can see, that I, I reduced the binning size here to 10 KB from 100 KB to have a better resolution. And we do see that dip in, in, in the uh, uh, methylation percentage exactly at the edges of the lads. And uh, what we think uh, is happening here is that because the edges of the lads are enriched in CPTF binding size, so the, the, the methylation rates for both DAM methylation and CPG methylation should be lower than outside and inside of the lab. And that's all we're observing here. Um, and similar to the CPG methylation at the bottom, we can see at, as we're moving inside the lab region, uh, we see uh, the, increase, the decrease in methylation call. And this has been a pretty much a work in progress. We are working on a lot of different things to expand on this assay and this method. Uh, we are incorporating haplotype phasing uh, into the current analysis. Uh, and obviously for that, we are moving uh, into a diploid cell line and uh, we are moving uh, away from uh, HAP1 cells. Um, and as we know that uh, long read sequencing one of the advantages of it is that we can phase the reading to different alleles uh, way more robustly than short root sequence. So we want to take advantage of that and look at hopefully uh, any allele specific lamina associated domains interactions. Um, and another thing that we're working on is to enhance the performance of methylation clock. As I said earlier, we, are, we need to generate better training sets. So we are focusing on uh, genomes that have a better chamber representation, so uh, we would end up with a better gener with a better training set and ultimately better uh, methylation calling. Um, what we are also focusing right now is on is that uh, that we want to call these LAD and differentially methylation region methylated regions solely based on nanocore data. We don't want to do uh, conventional DAM ID anymore. And for, to do that, we are looking at a variety of different algorithms, such as circular uh, binary segmentation algorithms, to identify these regions robustly just based on the long read data. And lastly, what I didn't get the chance to talk in my, uh, in my presentation today is the use of packed biosequencing. Uh, we know that packed biosequencing is very robust and very accurate in calling M6A methylation. So we want to also take advantage, take advantage of that and compare it with ONT and conventional um, DAM ID data and to see uh, how bitter the PAC biosequencing is uh, uh, in calling M6A methylation than uh, the other two platforms here. And with that, uh, I want to thank all the members of the Simp Lab, uh, our collaborators, Boss and Don and also NHGRI for their support and funding of this study. Thank you.